Well, once again, Echo Church, good morning, and man, I'm so glad to be back with you today. Before I get into where we're headed this Sunday, let me just give you an encouragement for next Sunday. You, you want to be here to hear uh, my friend Davey Blackburn share on his, on his story. Maybe some of you already know about Davey, that back in 2015, that his wife was uh, tragically murdered in a, a home invasion, and um, since moving to Indianapolis, I've gotten to be friends with him, and just uh, he's so encouraged by what God is doing in and through his life, and the story of redemption that's being written. You, you want to be here, and he's going to just share how God is redeeming the greatest pain I think many of us could ever even uh, think to, uh, to imagine, and uh, maybe you or somebody you know has been walking through some pain as well, and maybe you're having a hard time believing that God's got redemption for it. You, you want to be here to hear his story. It's going to be so hopeful and, uh, and so encouraging. Bring somebody with you as well. It's going to be a really, really powerful uh, Sunday. Uh, I also am so glad to be back with you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be away last weekend. It's funny, I'll tell my kids something like that, and they're like, did we have a choice, Dad? I'm like, well, not really, but still thank- thankful to, to be able to, uh, to, to get away. And uh, trips like that are just so encouraging for me, and which is good for us. And I uh, was able to be with the founder of the ARC Network, Pastor Greg Surratt, and you've heard me talk about him a little bit during this, this series, and uh, years ago they uh, planted uh, ARC Church Plant number one, uh, almost 20 years ago, in fact, down in Birmingham, Alabama, with Pastor Chris Hodges and Church of the Highlands, who wrote the book of, of the series, What's Next, that we're walking through right now, and so many of you bought the book last week, we actually ran out of the book, and we bought more, and so if you bought a copy, yours is, yours is out there at the welcome table uh, waiting on you, but it was so good to be with Pastor Greg um, last uh, last week and last weekend, and we got a little bit of fly fishing in in between. Some of you saw that uh, online, and you're like, "How many fish did you catch?" And I was like, "The two I showed you online. Like those were the two fish that that I caught." My excuse is that it, it was cold, okay, and so the the fish were still hanging out down at the bottom of the river. But it was a good good trip. So thank you guys for allowing me to to, uh, to be away uh, last Sunday. Pastor Chris's message was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, just to to hear him up on up on screen, man, just a just a wonderful guy and. Uh, Kate, or Ava and I are going to be reading his book this coming week. Some of you know that I'm walking Ava through a year of discipleship before she turns 13. And uh, uh, she and I are reading several books together. We're going to read this book, What's Next, together uh, here in, uh, in the coming week. So if you, uh, if you didn't get a chance to buy one last Sunday, just hop on Amazon. I think they're on sale there as well. Not as cheap as we were able to offer it last week, but they're still, they're still pretty low. So hop on Amazon and grab yours today, okay? If you guys are excited to hop in today, let me hear you make a little bit of noise. Come on, a little bit of noise. Get started today. It's okay to have some fun in church, right? So this series, listen, is designed, this What's Next series, is designed to show that God wants to take you, God wants to take us on a spiritual journey, that he has places and heights that he wants to take you your life, things he wants to do through you. There's so much more to life in Christ than most of us even know to look for. You're you're on a pathway with God, uh, even if you don't know it. Maybe even before you begin a relationship with God, you're still on a pathway with God. You have a next step to take. The problem is that so many people, they don't know where they are on the spiritual journey, so they don't know the next step to take. We want to help bring clarity throughout this series. In fact, this has been our, our anchor passage. We'll put it up on the screen. It says this, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. Maybe you would say, man, that's, that sounds like my life verse right now. I'm kind of stumbling all over myself in, in finances or in marriage or in my career decisions, my choices. I just feel like I just keep making one mistake after another. And I think for a lot of us, we focus on the problem. We say, well, if that problem would just get out of my way, then my life would be better. But the truth is the problem isn't the problem. The problem is that there's not a bigger focus that rises our eyes and rises our focus above the problem. In fact, the wise man Solomon goes on to tell us that. He says, but when they attend to what he reveals, right? So they're stumbling all over themselves because they can't see what God is doing. But when they attend, when they pay attention to what God reveals, they are most blessed. You might be saying, well, you mean God actually shows us what he wants for our life? And the answer is absolutely yes. All throughout the scriptures, God shows us the pathway that he has for us. If we will attend our lives, we'll we'll focus our lives around that purpose, that's where the most joy comes from. In week one, you might remember that we detailed all of what Jesus went through as he marched to to the cross. And as a church, what we want to do is be motivated to help one another live into the fullness of what Jesus died to give us. 
There's so much of what Jesus went to the cross to, to give us. Well, what a shame it would be if we lived beneath what Jesus died to, to give every single one of us. So how do we attend to it? How do we know? Well, all throughout the Bible, there are four things, and you can, you can call it different things, you can categorize it differently, but there are four things that God wants to give us. David calls it the path, the way of life. He says, you will show me the, the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. David is saying that you can actually live in the presence of God. You don't just have to come to church on Sunday to be in God's presence. You don't have to just go to your small group or serve all good things, but you can actually walk in the presence of God moment by moment, day by day, if you'll attend to what he reveals. There's a pathway of life. There's a way that God has ordained. <coughs> Excuse me. There's, we can have pleasures with him. It's it's not going to church, it's not a religion, it's actually life with God. Some of you, if I'd be so bold to say, you've been stuck for a while. There, there, there's something in your life that you just kind of feel like you're spinning your wheels and you're not moving forward. You feel stuck. And I just want you to be encouraged this morning. God has more for you. Not, not just the person sitting next to you, not just in theory. No, no, God has more for you. He wants you to be unstuck. He wants you to live in the fullness of all that he has for you. Here are the four things. Now, I know Pastor Chris uh, outlined them in great detail last Sunday. I want to give us just a brief synopsis of that. The first one is that you're supposed to know God. Know God. You can write that down in your notes. I know you just have blank lines today. You can just follow along with me on the screen. You can, you can know God. And I don't mean just like intellectually, but you can actually know God personally, intimately. You can have a relationship with God. Not a religion, but a relationship. See, we think this is so important that every single Sunday we give people the opportunity to respond, to, to begin a relationship with Jesus. Maybe that's why you're here today. You, you, you might say, well, I don't know that I have a relationship with Jesus. And we'll, we'll give you that opportunity at the end of the service to be incredibly non-threatening, just to surrender your life to Jesus. That might be why you are here. In fact, in the just 19 months, what we've seen here at Echo Church, we've seen over 215 people surrender their lives, begin a life-saving relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> See, once you, once you know God, that's the first step, he's got more for you. See, you, what I want you to see as we kind of show this synopsis here is you can't go to the next step until you've completed the first one. To live into the fullness of what God has for you, you've, you've got to complete the first step. You must know God first. And the second thing is that he wants you to live fully. He wants you to live, he wants you to live fully. What does it mean to live fully? Well, it, it's all the things in your life that you know you'd be better if you left behind, right? Well, you, you, can, you can quickly come up with a list in your own mind. It might be a, a habit, a, a hurt, an, a, an addiction, a, a shame. There's a failure from your past. All these things from your past that are preventing you from moving into your future. Listen, I, I fully believe this. I think the scriptures teach this, that you can't see your future until you've dealt with your past. You can't see your future until you've dealt with your past. And once you settle your past, once you're finding freedom, that's the words Pastor Chris would use, once you're beginning to live fully for what God made for you, then, here's the third thing, you get to discover purpose. You get to discover purpose, and specifically your purpose. God designed you with a purpose. Well, how do you do that? Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that today. That's going to be the detail of what we're going to unfold today. But you were made on purpose for a reason. God wants you to have focus and clarity of why he made you. See, a lot of people, they never settle their past so they can't clearly see their future. And so they never get around to number four, which is this, that God wants you to make a difference. God wants you to make a difference with your life. More than making a dollar, God designed you to make a difference. Your best life, your highest calling is not the boat. It's not a bigger house. It's not more money. It's not a better job. All those things are fine. Those are all fine things. But God has something more for you. See, your highest calling is to help others discover their God-given purpose. Your best life is a step into that, using your life to make a difference. You see, the problem, statistics have shown, is that 87%, it's really a staggering percentage, 87% of people going to church have no idea what their God-given purpose is. See, as a church, we are called the body of Christ. Did you know that? That's what the scriptures say about the church of Jesus, that we are a body of Christ. But 87% of us don't know what part we play in the body. 
Now, just imagine, like, trying to function. Like, if 80% of, 87% of your body didn't function, you wouldn't unfunction, right? Like, you wouldn't know what to do. Your ear's trying to be an eye, and your eye's trying to be a knee, and your knee's trying to be an elbow. Like, you, you, would, you would be incapacitated. You would be unable to breathe, unable to move if 87% of your body didn't know what to do. See, it's our dream as a church to help every single person discover their purpose and put it to practice making a difference that would be this fully functioning body making a difference in our community, making a difference in our state, making a difference around the world. Well, how do you do it? Well, first, you've got to know God. You start learning to live fully, discovering your purpose and making a difference. This is how God begins to work it out in our lives. See, the reason that most don't make a difference is they're often chasing the wrong purpose. They're often chasing the wrong purpose. The Apostle Paul says it like this in Romans 12 too. He says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. He's saying the world is chasing after something. They are pursuing a purpose. It's just the wrong purpose. They're, they're pursuing the, the wrong thing. The world is in pursuit of something, but they're coming up empty. And when they come up empty, that's when we get hatred and violence and murder and just kind of trying to jockey for a position against one another. When you come up empty, you start grabbing for straws, right? The ills of society are because we're focused so often on the wrong thing. We're, we're often in pursuit of something that doesn't satisfy. And Paul says, don't, don't, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world. No, no, God has something better for you. He goes on to say, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Here, listen to this. Then you will know God's will for you. So in other words, once you know God and you start to learn to live fully, then you are free to begin discovering your purpose. Then it says, once you allow God to make you into a new person, then you're going to know what God's plan is for you. It's good, it's pleasing, and it's perfect. Today we're going to complete the What's Next series on a really special day. Listen, I believe this message is for every single person in here, but I think it's especially going to be encouraging for mothers. That's why we wanted to put this uh, message on today. I, I think wherever you are in your life, it's going to be helpful. It's going to be encouraging. It's going to be, I hope, something unique that maybe you haven't heard before that will help you live into your purpose, but especially for those of you that are women, that are moms here in the room. I think it's going to be an encouragement to you. I need you to look, find somebody around you. Find somebody around you, okay? I don't know, it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, you, it can be your favorite person. It can be your least favorite person. Just don't tell them which it is, okay? I need you to look at them and say this with confidence. I was born for this. Come on, look at somebody. Say, I was, I was born. I was born for this. Okay, now look at the other person because they were looking at you and you looked the other way and say, I was born for this. Come on, with confidence. I was born for this. Now pick the third person who's still feeling lonely. Go on, go on. Somebody, I want you to get this. I was, I was born for this. Come on, find somebody. I was born for this. Listen, I'm calling this message today. I was born for this because what you need to know is that our dream as a church is not to become bigger, although bigger is fine because that hopefully means we're reaching more people and more people are discovering a relationship with Jesus. Our dream is that every person that calls the Echo home, that they would wake up in the morning and what they're about to do, they would say, I was born for this. I was born for this. This is what God designed me to do. Being a church planner is hard work. Being a pastor, hard work. You guys have hard jobs too. But I can wake up every morning and I know I was born for this. This is what God made me to do. And it's not reserved for pastors, right? In the scriptures, God teaches us how to discover our God-given purpose, how to walk out this pathway of life. We're going to lean into it more today. I, I want you to go after it because God has a purpose for you. It's not just reserved for me. It's not just reserved for, for spiritual leaders. God has a purpose for you, and he wants you to discover it. I thought perhaps the the best way to begin today of helping us discover our purpose is to make sure that we're aware of the enemies of purpose. Are you with me? The enemies of purpose. One of those is confusion. You can write that down, confusion. Confusion is an enemy of purpose. Now, we're going to hopefully clear that up a, a little bit today, but I think a lot of us are confused about our purpose. Paul would say, I don't want you to be ignorant of the gift of God that is in you. The whole reason we designed Echo Steps, you just heard about it in the Echo News video. It's the only announcement you hear every single Sunday because we want you to get on Echo Steps. Get on the Echo Steps, get on the Echo Steps. It's a class we've designed for two weeks. You don't have to give us your whole life. There's two Sundays, the first and third Sunday of every month. We want to help you get on the Echo Steps journey. The class you will graduate from is the Echo Steps journey you never graduate from. That's what this is. It's know God. Live fully. Discover purpose and make a difference. Come to the class. And the whole reason we designed it is 
for you to discover your purpose. The purpose of the class is for you to discover your purpose. That's what it's there for. We want to help you get on the Echo Steps journey. Everybody here, we would love to have you come, if you haven't already, get on the Echo Steps journey. Here's the second thing, is comparison. Comparison. An enemy of purpose is comparison. What did Paul say? He said, don't copy. Don't copy. In other words, don't, 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 don't try to get somebody else's calling. So often, you know, we're, we're looking on social media. Can I just can I make a pastoral statement today? Get off social media, all right? I mean, you can, it's fine to get on there and share things with friends and family, but listen, there's so much that's on there that's just not helpful because what's happening are people are getting on and they're comparing their calling to somebody else's calling. I was, I was laughing recently. I, I almost brought along some photos, but I didn't want to embarrass anybody in our family, so you are not allowed to go ask my kids which one of them this was, okay? All right, you, you, can't, you can't do it. It's between us, okay? But I was going to post a, a, a couple of photos. Recently on a trip to, to Florida, we were all uh, riding bikes uh, along this beautiful coastline. The sun was setting. There were palm trees everywhere. It was wonderful. We all stopped, and we were getting a selfie with a, our bikes, and you know, we were all smiling and so forth. And that was the first photo. There was one among us who was not having a good time. And then the second photo, there was like this nasty face. And then in the third photo, they're not even in the photo. We kicked them out of the photo. They were not allowed to be in it. You know what I'm saying? I, again, I was going to bring it, but I was like, no, I don't want to embarrass them. You're not allowed to ask who it was. But if I had just posted the first photo, you'd be like, man, the Lunsfords, they are living it up. Everything's perfect in their life. There's the sunset. There's the palm trees. There's the beach. It's wonderful. It wasn't wonderful. I was about to spank one of my children, okay? It wasn't great. We've got our own problems, too. What you see on social media, see, what you're often doing is you're comparing your behind-the-scenes footage with, so, footage with somebody else's highlight reel. It's all, it's all edited. It's all, it's all this, is, this is the best of me and the best possible lighting and the best possible filter that I can make myself look like. And I, can, I just say, can I just say to moms, can I just say to women, like a, just, just get off Facebook, right? Just get off you know, Pinterest and Instagram or at least stay off it a lot, you know what I'm saying? Because you're going to get on there and be like, man, how does that mom do it? And the truth is they're not doing it, all right? You, I mean, they're like, they're a personal chef to every one of their kids' specific needs, you know? They're, they're perfectly fit because they're always at the gym. Somehow they have the perfect crafts and the perfect projects for, their, for every one of their children. And, and you know, they get, they get their, their kids to every club, the, the, every sports opportunity that's out there. And listen, it's not true, <laughs> okay? I heard somebody this week compare people to balloons, that if they're not, like, mindfully, like, releasing the pressure, they're either one moment away from popping or one moment away from completely deflating. You know, like you just let it go and it's like knocking everything over in the process. I think that's a good, isn't that a good analogy for what a lot of us are feeling? Listen, stop comparing your calling to somebody else's. That's not what you're designed for. God has something unique for you. And if you're going to start chasing after someone's calling, listen, you're a, you're a bad copy. But you're a really great original. God's got something unique that he wants to do in and through you. One of the greatest enemies of your purpose is to start comparing yourself to someone else. We want to lean into the freedom of, no, no, I want to pursue what God has for me. In the Bible reading plan this week, some of you might have read in Proverbs where it talked about a, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, a peaceful heart. You, you, I think you would agree with that. When, when you're at peace, it just gives life to you and everybody around you. Man, the greatest peace you can have is pursuing your calling, your purpose, not someone else's. Get, get comparison out of the picture. Here's the third one. third one is just simply counterfeit. A counterfeit purpose, a counterfeit purpose. You See, so often people think their purpose is their career. And can I just be so bold to say, you don't need a career, you need a calling. You need a calling. God has a call on your life. And it's, 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 it's outside of a career. The career might be a part of it, but God has a specific calling that he has for you. You might have thought it was money. Listen, money's not a bad thing. Money, money can be a very good thing, but... Money is not your calling. God has something so much bigger for you. It's going to sound cliche, but it's so true. God has a plan for your life. He does. See, God's purpose was actually ahead of you. Think about it. When, when, when God made you, he already had the purpose in mind, and so he made you to fulfill, he made you to fulfill the purpose. Listen, listen to what the psalmist says. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I love this, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Can you imagine just standing in front of the mirror tomorrow and you're like, God, your works are wonderful. Like this is, wow, you did something unique when you made me. Like this is, this is fantastic. That's, that's kind of what David's doing. And it sounds egotistical, but it's not. He's just confident in how God has made him. What does he go on to say? I know it full well. I know exactly how and why you made me. How well do you know yourself? 
How well do you know how God designed you? He goes on to say, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. I love this, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God saw you before he fashioned you. He ordained your days. He had a purpose, and he said, now I'm going to create them to fulfill the purpose. Why would you waste your time going after a counterfeit? Why would you waste your time comparing your life to somebody else's when he designed you to fulfill a purpose? He's perfectly equipped you to carry it out. See, God designed you with a plan in mind. You have abilities and passions and experiences that make all of us better. You've even walked through some pain, haven't you? And God wants to use that pain to redeem something in your life to teach all the rest of us about it. You're going to walk beside someone and say, no, I've been there, and here's what God taught me. Listen, God never wastes a hurt. God will never waste a hurt. The scriptures say that God wants to give you the desires of your heart. Does that mean that God wants to give you everything you want? No, no, it means God gives you the want. (laughs) He puts the desire in your heart to lead you and guide you in the path that he has for you. There's things you do that actually make you come alive. And when they make you come alive, that's when you can make your greatest difference. And we want to help you discover that. I remember um, when we believed that God was calling us to come back home and plant a church back in the great Hoosier State. And I would call up some friends and a, a couple of just spiritual leaders in our lives. And I was like, do you see this in me? Do you see this in us? Is this what God has for us? And I remember a couple of our friends were like, not only do we see it, we've been telling you this is what you're supposed to do. But I, I didn't see it in myself, and so I, I don't even remember those conversations. I was like, oh, you did? Yes, we, we kept telling you this. There's things that people see in you that you don't even see just yet. There's things you do that are specifically designed for you to bring into the world. So here's what I want to do with our remaining time. I want to quickly show you four ways. I'm going to look throughout the Bible, four ways that people discover their God-given purpose. Okay, four ways. There's probably more, but I think a lot of them fall into these four categories. Number one is simply this. There's a plan, a plan from the beginning. That's the first one. There's a plan from the beginning. I think a lot of people, a lot of people, especially when they're younger, have a greater sense of their purpose. You might even say, man, when I was younger, I thought, I felt, I wanted to. And then you might, you know, follow that that up with well then some problems came in and some debt came in and some challenges came in and come on somebody some kids came into the picture right and it kind of changes some of some of the plan but if you were to look back you say no i think there was a plan there in the beginning some of you would say well i think i've traveled way too far away from what god's original purpose was for me and maybe you're here today to hear that the call of god is irrevocable on your life That whatever God destined you to do, you have not traveled too far away from it. No matter where you are, God can fulfill it. I love what Jeremiah says. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. and I, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before you came to be in the womb, I had a purpose and a plan. I even set you apart. I ordained your days to come. It's exactly what God says over every single one of us. I love what Pastor Chris says. I can't remember if he said it in the video or not, so I apologize if it's repetitive. I've heard him say it so many times. When he's talking about his purpose, he'll talk about how whenever he was in college, now think about this. He speaks to tens of thousands, quite honestly, probably hundreds of thousands of people across the globe, speaks. Whenever he was a sophomore in college at Louisiana State University, he failed speech class. <laughs> Think about that. I got my, my Louisiana friend back in the back. And then Chris will follow it up with saying, they don't even speak English in Louisiana. How did I fail speech class, right? It doesn't even, doesn't even make sense. Am I right, Tony? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? Think about this. A guy that failed speech class felt so far away from his purpose, and now he's speaking to hundreds of thousands of people, writing books that are going to change lives. You, you think you're too far away from your purpose, and God says, no, 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 I set you apart. That's what I love so much about Echo Kids. Every single Sunday, our dream team is speaking life and encouragement and purpose and hope and calling over our kids, over your kids, every single Sunday. It's so important. You are loved. You are called. You are destined for greatness, okay? Some of you, there's a plan from the beginning. If you were to think back, you'd say, no, no, I I think I can see what God designed me for. Here's the second thing. There's a developing realization. A developing realization. Maybe you can write down as a, a growing awareness. There's a developing realization that God is doing something 
in you. I think, I think the best example of this in the Bible would come from Joseph. He, he, maybe you don't know the story of Joseph, but he pretty much his story takes up the final 20 chapters of the book of Genesis. There's a, a long story and a lot of detail that comes out of it, but early in his life he was given a calling and a purpose. There was a dream. He could see what was coming. But all the subsequent chapters up until one of the last chapters looks like everything in his life is going away from God. God put this purpose and this plan there and everything else it seems like is going away from what God had said he was going to do. And then somehow miraculously God uses all of those twists and turns to actually bring about his God-given purpose. Years later when Joseph is now second in command of Egypt, right, he went from being sold into slavery by his brothers to now being second in command of all Egypt. And it says that he's in charge of handing out the food rations and the water. And all of the land around them is in a great famine. And so it says that his brothers come to get food for their family. And they come to Joseph. But they don't recognize him at first because he looks Egyptian now. And they come and when they recognize him, they fall before him. They're afraid they're going to die. And then Joseph says this. He says, you intended to harm me. Right? All this stuff that was happening. That looked like it was going away from God. But God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. Listen, God wants to use every part of your life. The mountains, but especially the valleys. Especially the valleys. Your hurts, your shames, your, your failures. What does the Bible say? That God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Maybe you are or you have walked through a divorce. Maybe you are or you have walked through a, a situation of joblessness or confusion trying to figure things out maybe you've been trying to have a child and you're trying to figure out wh- what do we do next maybe you walk through the pain of of miscarriage what, whatever it might be you, you look back and you're like i don't understand this road it doesn't make any sense and joseph would say no no somebody else might have intended it for harm but god's going to bring it about for good God's actually going to use it to bring about your purpose of what he wants to do in and through your life. You're going to hear from Davey next Sunday. One of the worst moments any of us could ever even fathom or think that you could walk through. I'm certain in the moment he thought that he had lost his present and his future. His wife of several years and their soon-to-be second child that was in his wife's body that, that, that passed away as well. And he's going to tell you the story next Sunday of what God is doing in their life right now and how he's bringing about redemption and grace and how God's actually using it for a great purpose in and through their lives. Listen, God will use your past to redefine your future. God will use your past to unlock your future. God has got great things for you. For some of you, there might be this developing realization that God is up to something. Here's the third thing, seizing the moment. Seizing the moment. Another way to say it might be like, walking through an open door, an opportunity. You, we see this powerfully in the life of Esther. She, uh, her parents are dead. She's adopted by her uncle uh, Mordecai. She's Jewish in a Babylonian culture. She just she stands out. She, does, she doesn't fit in this society. The king of the day wants to show off his beautiful wife in front of a party, and she doesn't consent, and so the, the current queen is fired, and he hosts a beauty pageant to find the new queen. And Esther wins the beauty pageant well at the exact same time that all this is happening there's a man inside the king's court who's trying to exterminate the jewish population so her uncle mordecai comes to her and he's like i don't think you're in this position just so that you get to be queen and and sit on your high horse and have a great life i think god placed you in this position to seize this moment he says this in verse 14 of esther 4 for if you remain silent at this time Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In other words, you can be silent. You can say nothing to the king, and you think that you're going to be saved, but it's actually not going to happen. Or you can speak up. You can take a risk. To to stand before the king uh, unannounced, uh, uh, uninvited, could, could mean her head. She could be like the last queen. And he says, you know, you need to walk through this door. You need to seize the moment. God's placed you here for this time so that salvation can come to the Jews. Maybe you're walking through something right now. There's an open door right in front of you that you need to take a risk and walk through it. God might have a purpose that he's bringing about in and through your lives. I think a lot of times people miss their purpose because they're afraid to step. 
afraid to step, seizing the moment. Here's the fourth and final one. Fourth and final one is simply this. It's a divine moment. A divine a divine moment. Another way of saying it might be a, a God encounter. We see this with the Apostle Paul. Uh, at the time of the story, you're going to see in just a moment, his, his name at the time is Saul. Eventually, in the transformation with, with Jesus, he becomes called Paul. But right now, he's called Saul. And Saul is quite literally going in the opposite direction that God wants him to go. It says that he's actually murdering Christians, that those who are following the way of Jesus. He's, he's going after them. And while he's in route to go and take out more Christians, he has this divine appointment, this God encounter. It says this in verse 3 of Acts chapter 9. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And then he says, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. I think there's so much richness in here for, the, for us. He's going in the opposite direction of what God wants him to do, and God turns him around. I think this can happen in our lives. I think what I've discovered most in my life, there, there can be like an unsettling, there can be a stirring. Things are going along just fine. Externally, everything should be good, right? Pay's good, life's good, relationships are good, but there's this unsettling, there's this stirring that you're like, I don't feel like I'm in the right spot, the right position, the right situation. There's something that's supposed to change. Hang on to that for just a moment. Because I think it's also interesting that God doesn't get rid of the problem. In this moment, Saul is a problem. Can we all just agree that God could smite him, right? Like, we could, we could go all, you know, this, this, he, he could be done. No longer living. Saul never becomes Paul. He's done. But God actually uses it in a couple of ways. When the Christians are being persecuted, they're all together in one place. They're in Jerusalem. But the persecution actually sends them out. The first missionaries to go out into the world did so because they were kind of forced to go out because they were afraid for their lives. And then they settled in other places. And then they just started sharing Jesus. So God used the pain to take his word into the world. But he didn't get rid of Saul. No, no, he transforms him into Paul, and he ends up writing half of the New Testament. See, I think the way we look at theology would be like, well, when I'm out of God's will, God's just going to move me out of the way. But that's not what he does. He actually gives Saul a purpose. You're going to change the world. You're going to take the message of Jesus across the globe. Can you think of a more unlikely person to do it? And I hope that's encouraging to you because you might be in a situation right now and you're like, man, I feel so far away from what God has for me. And I would just say, no, no, you're one divine appointment away from the calling that God has for you. You're one moment away from stepping into the fullness that God wants to bring about in your lives. This moment for me and Katie, it came almost exactly three years ago. I mean, almost exactly to the day when this when Echo Church be, began to be a bit of a dream of like, maybe God is up to something. Over the course of about seven days, we had this divine appointment where through time in prayer and time in uh, worship, time in the, 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 the word, uh, time speaking to other leaders and friends in our lives, that God just pulled back the veil of, no, no, this is what I'm doing. It was still scary. <laughs> Took a lot of risk. But man, I'm so glad we did. I'm so glad we stepped into it. You might be having this divine appointment, this God encounter. Where you're like, I think God is telling me to step and risk and move in this way or in this direction, or at least to begin walking out the steps. Right? It might not be church planning necessarily. It could be. It might be, no, no, I just need to take my next step. God's inviting me to take my next step. I've, I've been holding back for far too long. See, what happens, I think for a lot of people, they misdiagnose the stirring. You know what I'm saying? God will create this unsettling. He'll create this stirring. And what often happens is people are uneasy and they'll, they'll run away from God. But the purpose of the stirring is that you would run to God so that you would have a God encounter, so that you would have a divine appointment. We talked about this a couple weeks before Easter. I remember how God will often allow problems in our life so that we'll pursue him. And in, in the pursuit, we get, to, we get to experience his presence at a new level. Do you remember that? Don't let the stirring push you away. And if, if you're in the middle of a stirring season, allow it to, to push you to God, to get into the presence of God. Just, just go after him with all that you have. Kate and I were praying for months and months and months and months. And then in a matter of seven days, he was like, okay, this is what I've been up to. 
This is what I've been doing. This, this is what this story was all about. I had to bring you on this journey just so that you could see what I've been up to all along. Would, would you write this down? This is the final thing. It's simply this. God created me on purpose for a purpose. You are not an accident. I do not care how your life began. God created you on purpose for a purpose. He had a purpose in mind, and so he made you to fulfill that purpose. And we want to help you walk it out. As we were sitting around uh, this, uh, this past week out in Montana, a bunch of pastors, Pastor Greg Surratt, the founder of the Art Church Planning Network, we were sitting around talking, and I just, I just had this massive smile on my face thinking about this story that he was telling. Pastor Greg was talking about all of the different bumps, although I don't think he would call them bumps in the moment, all these different bumps that he encountered early in ministry. He was talking, and he was just sitting around laughing. He was like, yeah, my first church I was fired from. And then he was like, my second church I was fired from. He was like, he kind of smiled. He's like, that one wasn't my fault. There was a bunch of us fired together. <laughs> and then I was fired from my third church. And then he just got this big smile on his face. He's like, let me tell you about the fourth church that I applied for. Because I went, I went to apply for this, this little bitty church in Illinois, and he said there were nine people. And it was the, the, the type of church that you would go and you would you'd preach, and then they'd vote on you to see if they wanted you to be your pastor. Man, come on, that, that's some pressure, right? So there were nine people. I was preaching to all of nine people, and they voted unanimously to not allow me to be their pastor. <laughs> he was like, early in my career, early 20s, four strikes. You know, because it was not working. His, his fifth church, his fifth opportunity, there were 13 people. They voted 11 into 2 to keep him. <laughs> the other two eventually voted again with their feet. They're like, okay, we said we didn't like you. We're, we're moving on. He's like, I went through this great depression. It was just this this difficult time and the stirring and the settling actually caused him to go to Charleston, South Carolina for an opportunity. The opportunity didn't work out. So I don't even know what, like, what strike we're on now. Like, how many, this is not working out. A wiser person might have said, I don't think this is your calling. You should go another direction. But he knew the call of God on his life. And all of those led up to him starting Seacoast Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Then one day he stood before his congregation and said, I think God's calling us to launch 2,000 life-giving churches in our lifetime. And we're now over 800 churches in in the Ark Network. We were a part of it. And I don't know if you and I would be sitting here today if it weren't for him. Fighting through some adversity, fighting through some challenges, little by little, just endurance and going after it. And you have a God-given purpose. I don't know what, what you're walking through today. I don't know what challenge you're facing, but I'm telling you, would you keep going? Would you keep fighting for it? Would you, would you just push aside the confusion and the comparisons and the counterfeits? Because God's got something unique for you. As a church, we're signed up to help you discover it. Your job, your role is to say, God, I'm going to go for it. I'm not going to stop at nothing to discover the purpose that you made me for. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for today. Lord, what a privilege it is to be in your presence. What a privilege it is to know you to find freedom so we can live fully Lord the life that you've given us but we know God that you don't you don't want us to stop there we don't just come to know you in the way for heaven no no you've got something for us here and now and Lord we want to discover your purpose for our lives I want to pray for us this morning and maybe one of those spoke to you today maybe it was one of those enemies of the of purpose that have been too big in your life, or maybe one of the things that can help you discover your purpose. You're like, I see it. There was, there, there was a plan for me in the beginning. Uh, maybe, I, maybe you're walking through a divine appointment right now. Maybe there's a stirring and unsettling. You need to pursue God and, and lean into him more. Maybe you need to seize the moment. There's an open door right in front of you right, right now. Maybe there's some adversity you're facing, and you're, you're, you're thinking about going the other direction. No, 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 you, you need to lean in because God's got something unique for you. If you're here today, you're like, man, I feel like I'm in a bit of a fight, but I want to keep going to discover my God-given purpose. Would you just raise your hand up right now? I'd love to have the privilege of praying for you. Come on, there's hands all over the room. Just lift them up high. Come on. That's wonderful. So put your hand down. As you open up your heart, you don't have to pray this out loud, but would you just pray this prayer? Would you say, Lord, thank you you see me, God, that you know me, and that I can know you. Just tell him that. You say, Lord, thank you that I get to live fully, to leave behind the, the failures of the past. Would you
you say this, Lord, I know you made me to discover my purpose. With authority, would you just pray something like this? Lord, I'm going to discover it. I'm going to live it out. I'm going to make a difference. Maybe you pray something like, Lord, help me to see. Help me to see with your eyes all that you designed me for, all that you designed me to be. And would you say something like this, Lord, I'm not stopping until I discover it. Because God, I want to be able to wake up every day and say I was born for this. Maybe you're here today and that prayer is not for you, but there'll be another prayer. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus yet, but you'd like to be. You'd like to know God and live fully and discover purpose and make a difference with your life. It begins with a relationship with Jesus, a moment where you say to him, Lord, I'm living in to what you have for me. It's a moment where you say, Lord, I, I believe you died on the cross because I need your forgiveness. I believe you rose up from the dead because you want to give me a brand new life. If that's you today, I don't want you to stand up or come to the front. We don't want to embarrass you, but with all eyes closed and all heads bowed for just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity to respond and say, that's me. That's me. If that's you, if you want to be counted in this prayer, would you just slip your hand up for just a moment right now? I'd love to have the privilege of praying for you. If you want to begin a relationship with Jesus today, just raise it up high. And if that's you, would you pray this simple prayer? Would you say, Lord, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. Say, Lord, I'm turning from my old life and I'm turning to you because I believe you rose up from the dead to give me a brand new life. And today I'm going to follow you with all that I've got. With your help, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Lord, what a privilege. Lord, that you not only want us to know you, to live fully, you want us to discover our purpose because you're highest calling for us that we'd make a difference with our lives. Lord, we're going after it. We're not stopping. Lord, we want to be a church where everybody can wake up every day and say, I was born for this. I know what, what, what I'm designed to do. Lord, help us to walk it out. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.